Sören Grammel. And we are in the middle of the exhibition Sawa Vivre by Agnes Schira. And Sören, you are the curator of this exhibition. Yes, that's true. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the scene that we are uh, seeing behind? Of course, pleasure. Uh, yeah, that's directly the center of the installation and it refers to this motif of the late medieval tournament. Two knights fighting with each other uh, for the honor of their lady, mm -hmm. as it's said. And at that time it can be seen as a martial arts form that's also part of a military and reality codex, so to say. Yeah. So it was not a fight, it's not a fight scene, but it's actually a medieval sport uh, tournament. And uh, as far as I know, anyone was allowed to join as audience, but to be part of the tournament, uh, one should be a knight or noble knight or even higher a rank, a king. Yes. So, um, can you tell us the rules of this game? <laughs> the, many of us today think that the game is about either killing your opponent or knocking him off his horse. Mm -hmm. But actually, it, the winner of these tournaments was the knight who broke the most lances. So that was the aim of the game. Mm -hmm. Whether you hit the shield or the armor of your opponent, and sometimes people died, of course, or fell off their horses a lot, but it's not like in these night films that you know from cinema. Mm -hmm. it was, there were really meticulously led lists of broken lances. Mm -hmm. uh, we know manuscripts that count hundreds and hundreds pages just of mm -hmm. broken lances and the time when it happened and the date. And um, Agnes uh, told us that she made this exhibition only for uh, like after seeing the architecture. So it really fits the room very well. Uh, but at yeah. the same time, it has a um, connection to the city history and Heidelberg as a historical city. And what do you want to say about this aspect? I mean, you already said it, it's quite right. It's almost a site-specific installation on two levels. One is the exhibition space with its rectangular form that Agnes saw and immediately thought I, I could realize a tournament scene here. It almost, almost looks like a tournament square. And the other level is Heidelberg itself, which is a city that's very much based on medieval self-marketing and it has the oldest university in Germany, and it, which was found in the uh, late Middle Ages. Or they are very proud here to have the Codex Manesi, <laughs> which is a handwriting, <laughs> a medieval Manesse. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought in <laughs> English you say Manesi, <laughs> uh, the Codex Manesi. That's yeah. like American tourists might put it. So <laughs> the Codex Manesse is a medieval handwritten mm. and illustrated mm. book of uh, courtly love songs. It, yeah. And yeah, so these knights were creating codes of good manners, this idea of chivalry and their virtue. And um, I think it's very important to talk about the aspect of courtly love. Uh, because for me as a Turkish person, <laughs> the crusaders and crusades are like still used metaf metaphor for violent, um, at, like war um, in, by Christians. So it mm -hmm. ha doesn't have a good reputation, mm -hmm. but the knights were um, expressing not only their love to the noble ladies, but they mm -hmm. were also establishing themselves mm -hmm. in the higher society. Mm -hmm. So can you tell the um, constellation of love in courtly love uh, poems? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really interesting what, what you uh, uh, pointed. And uh, courtly love was a social system in a way with, with strict codes. And of course, it was also a system very much restricted to, to the LET. So yeah, just what you said about the Crusaders, but it also counted for the, 
for the lower social classes at that time in middle Europe as mm -hmm. well. These, uh, the codes of chivalry, uh, um, of certain higher behavior uh, patterns, of course this didn't count for peasants or servants. Yeah. So this is, the courtly law is really a, a very elitist system that mm -hmm. mirrors the the elitist society at that yeah. time, which was strictly separated in two classes. Yeah, but let's uh, explain it in a very simple way. In these poems, or the, the singers, Turuba duos, uh, are like writing, um, there is an idealized lady. Uh, she's unattainable, and in most cases, she is uh, married. And mm -hmm. uh, might are. Right. Uh, expressing this everlasting insatiable love for her um, but the virtue of woman is greater when she resists this attempts to seduce and the knight uh, is constantly singing about his desire and making complaints mm -hmm. that she's not um, showing any affection mm -hmm. and so on so it's actually for many, uh, for some researchers, it's the first time that women are idealized in the li literature and it's seen as a positive aspect, but at the same time it has no um, parallelity to the conditions of women uh, at that time. So it's uh, that's literally... A, yeah, that's a very important point, is the position of women Mm -hmm. in this system of courtly love and how that resembles the standards of society at that time. Mm -hmm. And for example, uh, the famous French psychologist uh, Jacques Lacan or today the cultural critic Slovenian uh, Slavoj Žižek, they say that the projection of the woman as something higher was actually part of compensating that women had hierarchically a very low position and in society at that time. Men. Yeah. What I uh, really uh, liked about reading in, for like medieval uh, times, um, the women were considered very um, libido, how you say, with higher libido in comparison to men. So the, the women mm -hmm. uh, were the reason for um, Sündenfall, for the lost paradise and original sin and so on. Uh, so Eve... And the women's as, sexuality. Yeah, Eve yeah. as a mm -hmm. seducer. And, um, and, but at the same time they thought that uh, women have more interest in sexuality and men should um, uh, frame the um, like boundaries for that. So it's actually a little bit different than in psychoanalysis that Freud thinks men have the active libido and the women are uh, more... Um, silent about their sexuality. It's the, it's the contrary um, idea. But, but what is crazy mm -hmm. about courtly love is the lady should reject. So uh, it's an interesting dynamic that the lady should say no and the um, um, knight should insist. And it, we still mm -hmm. see this kind of dynamics. You know, when you are saying this, it almost appears to me that this system of courtly love also is a kind of theater form yeah. with th certain actors and it's very clearly defined like which actor has to act in which way mm -hmm. and what's your role both as a knight or as a court woman, right? Yeah. There's a certain set of behavior patterns and you should uh, yeah, perform these according yeah, to the way to, they to are. To keep the tension also, to, yeah. to, to keep the story going. Yes. Yeah. And do you think that's something, do you, do you think that's something provocative for our time or? Um, yeah, thank you. It's, I, I, I think a lot ab uh, about this aspect 
and, but not only because of the consent saying yes or no, or what does it mean for a woman to say no or yes, but also the historical background, because um, some researchers suggest that this form of literature has affin affinity with the Arab philosophy. It, um, courtly law occurs, uh, emerges in uh, South France, Mm -hmm. and, and through Badours and um, researchers say it, 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 it was taken by the Sufi thinking in Andalusians and because Sufi uh, as like Islamic mystic has an, an eternal longing for God so we don't we cannot feel complete on this Earth, uh, on uh, because we have to think about the, uh, we we are burning in the love of God, but it's it's normal to I mean I mean God is not reachable, so if you feel this kind of desire to be unified, you should feel um, in love all the time, but desperately in love. But what happens when you? project this kind of love not to God because you are unified by death so it's it's kind of this kind of love but what happens when you project it to a woman because woman should is is, is a real person uh, in s some sense well the, so, the question is if there's if anyone can be a real person in the system of courtly, courtly love, love yeah. maybe do you agree with the way how Agnes placed the women when, when we talk about the position of women in, in society and also female desire? And here you see that in the background behind us, you see how she placed the court woman sculptures. They are sculptures, not real court women, of course, but they are standing aside, right? They are clearly bound to the function of audience. Do you agree with this? What I really like about the uh, exhibition that the um, female figures, the court ladies, are shallow. So they, they are not uh, complete. They have only one side. And when you walk upstairs, um, you see these figures are cut into half. And um, so it's also interesting way of telling that these figures are not real they're like projections and yeah I, 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 I think she's very critical about courtly love and this form of idealization and so on but at the same time in our historical research and um, lectures here we found out that the women were the commissioner of this tournament sometimes so they were so wealthy enough to sponsor a night and buying mm. the whole armor and um, they were also um, commissioning this kind of romance literature because they were the uh, consumer of this kind of literature so I'm uh, I'm not sure about the agency of uh, I think they had a great agency at the same mm -hmm. time yeah at, at, at this moment I would like to I, I just one thought came up so in a way they are patrons right yeah they're the patrons of, but, yeah but of course i mean in the end they they were not in power they did not rule even the court woman right they were married to a to a ruler yeah a local national whatever ruler with power uh, who already ga um, received taxes and was rich yeah. so are they a bit like in the art world where you sometimes have rich women yeah. uh, who are Spending but nevertheless of being them. of their husbands <laughs> to promote the arts while their husbands are, so to say, ruling the world, leading uh, large businesses? Um, I think there are similarities because this nobility have like one um, historian, Eleanor Janega, says um, they have so plenty of time to write this kind of poetry or they have plenty of time to express their uh, desire for each other 
because they're not working, whereas the whole work made by peasants mm -hmm. and um, um, how it's called, this kind of... Servants. Servants or serves, serves. Ser uh -huh. Uh, serves means this life eigene. Ah, so, yeah. Okay, yeah. So mm -hmm. the the whole world are um, mm -hmm. like anyway. Um, so of course they have time to read this kind of love poetry and commission. Um, yeah, they, these are like mm. uh, privileged wives of <laughs> wealthy wealthy yeah. husbands.